Hello, I'm Garni Barkadarian, Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, and I will be discussing today the topic of Rathke's cleft cysts as a part of the CNS Neurosurgery 100 lecture series. What is the incidence of any pituitary tumor for the average public? Well, on average, about 18% of people have an, some sort of abnormality in the pituitary gland. This is based on a large cadaveric analysis that demonstrated that the most common finding were Rathke's cleft cysts. Well, what are these Rathke's cleft cysts? Well, they're benign epithelial line cystic remnants of the Rathke's pouch. So here one can observe the formation of Rath Rathke's pouch uh, during development where the neuroectoderm and the mesoderm meet together uh, and de develop this small cleft in this location. The cleft actually is primarily from the uh, Rathke's pouch and the mesoderm, um, but does uh, wrap around the neuroectoderm as it comes down. So this is the area where some mucosal cells can be trapped and can develop into Rathke's cleft cyst. And in other cases, uh, a lecture on another topic, uh, craniopharyngiomas. The presenting symptoms for, for these types of cysts are more commonly headaches, endocrine dysfunction, and vision loss, although we do see a, not a small incidence of diabetes insipidus. Interestingly, less than 10% of people actually need surgery for Rathke's cleft cysts. In some cases, patients do present with intracystic hemorrhage, like apoplexy, or with cyst rupture can develop aseptic meningitis and this ensued headaches and or hormonal dysfunction. The gold standard is treatment with surgical drainage, and in some cases, certain factors can increase the risk of recurrence, including squamous metaplasia on pathological evaluation. Here's a very classic finding with the imaging of Rathke's cleft cyst. So on a sagittal view, post contrast, one can see the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland split from the posterior lobe here. And this two, the cyst contents can often be T1 hyperintense or hypointense if they're low proteinaceous content, and often T2 hyperintense or isointense. They can be quite large um, or relatively small, um, but it's not uncommon to find some uh, compression of the optic chiasm. Here's an example of a superglandular Rathke's cleft cyst, as the mesoderm does wrap around the neuroectoderm and even along the infundibulum, that can be a source of a Rathke's cleft cyst developing. And these patients often present with vision loss um, at the site of the cyst. This is a 46-year-old woman with a six-month history of amenorrhea, blurred vision, and headaches. And one can appreciate a rather sizable cystic lesion in the cella with supercellar extension and bowing of the optic chiasm. The pre-contrast T1-weighted MRI demonstrates a uh, hyperintense lesion in this location, and the post-contrast demonstrates enhancement of the surrounding gland, and in this location one can appreciate the anterior lobe being pushed anteriorly, and the posterior lobe remains posterior. So this is pretty typical for a Rathke's cleft cyst. Well, here's an example of surgical uh, management of such a cyst. Unlike for pituitary macroadenomas or meningiomas or other large lesions, we typically do not expose widely the cavernous sinus uh, as really these can be managed with a narrow exposure. We can always expose them later if necessary after we begin the operation if the diagnosis is not necessarily accurate. We open the dura sharply, um, identifying the underlying pituitary gland, trying to protect that as best as possible. We do want to auscultate the carotid artery on both sides to make sure that we do not inadvertently incise that region. Once this is done, the gland is then punctured. And here one can appreciate the cystic fluid contents that, that come out. The fluid contents in this case are somewhat proteinaceous with uh, evidence of hemorrhage uh, previously. There are solid components as well that are noted here and we tend to remove as much of the solid components as possible. In the setting of a hemorrhage, as this patient had, sometimes the solid components are very adherent to the surrounding normal pituitary gland, and one does not want to be very aggressive 
removing this as this can result in damage to the posterior pituitary gland and development of diabetes insipidus. Hence, we very carefully debulk this, wash out the area, um, and try to peel off only what can come naturally. In this case, uh, we did note that this was densely adherent to the posterior lobe as well as to the diaphragm cella, which uh, we, we did not want to also disrupt as that can result in a CSF leak. When we do decompress the cystic lesion, oftentimes there can be cavernous sinus bleeding, which is what we see here, um, but we are able to control that uh, in our dissection here. Um, here's with an angled endoscope, we can identify some component of the solid component of the, the cyst along the diaphragm, which we were able to keep and preserve. And although this patient did not develop a CSF leak, we did elect to pack with fat um, as we did not want a significant glandular descent resulting in hypopituitarism. And there's always a small chance that an exposed diaphragm like such can result in a postoperative CSF leak. Although in cases when we can avoid placing a fat graft, that's ideal as that can result uh, in a decreased recurrence rate if possible. Here the fat is packed intraglandularly. The dura is then overlaid down over the, over the exposed pituitary and then a collagen sponge, and in this case, a rigid buttress was used, although not necessarily uh, necessary, uh, but this is a, a nice way to have a good uh, reconstruction. And then the native sphenoid sinus mucosa is repurposed for our reconstruction, which is then glued into place with fiber and glue. And we feel that this reconstruction allows for a good re mucosalization of the sphenoid sinus, which can help maintain uh, and preserve sphenoid sinus function, postoperatively decreasing sinus dysfunction and crusting. This is the postoperative MRI that demonstrated a good decompression. You can see the fat in the cella, and there is glandular descent, albeit not as significant if uh, the fat graft had not been in place. Here is an example of a patient with a superglandular Rathke's cleft cyst. And while one could approach this with a supraglandular approach, which would result in a large CSF leak, uh, which would effectively be an extended approach, um, effectively a transtubercular approach. We elect to approach these through the gland as this allows us to decompress the cyst. These are almost always subdiaphragmatic in nature. And um, with uh, this approach, one can avoid a large CSF leak, which uh, has been associated loosely with the uh, increased risk of C uh, re gland recurrent sorry, cyst recurrence. So here's the, the case here where the gland was incised um, and we come up to the Rathke's cleft cyst and we're able to debulk this. And then there we are looking at the diaphragm cella, uh, which is still above the gland, uh, above the cyst, and the cyst is above the gland. This patient did quite well. And here's immediate postoperative MRI with good resolution of uh, the findings as well as the patient's symptoms. Now one common caveat is dealing with a, an arachnoid cyst. And the big difference between a Rathke's cleft cyst and arachnoid cyst is how it uh, is found on the MRI. Effectively, an arachnoid cyst is a CSF leak that leaks directly into the pituitary gland. So the fluid will look like CSF, as one can appreciate here. There's similar con uh, intensity on T1 and T2. And typically the gland is completely pushed in one direction or the other. So the gland is not split between anterior and posterior lobes, but is pushed one direction or the other. Also, one should be very careful that they're not operating on empty cellas. Empty cella is basically just a diverticulum of the um, arachnoid down into the cella, and there's really nothing to operate on. And the big difference here is one can appreciate the bowing down of the cella in an empty cella, whereas bowing up of cellar contents and the optic chiasm in an arachnoid cyst. So this is a key differentiator between an empty cella and an arachnoid cyst. One would not operate on an empty cella, and in some cases, one would operate on an arachnoid cyst if the patient is symptomatic or if the cyst is growing. And again, the fluid on an, in an arachnoid cyst is T1, T2 hyperintense and T1 hypointense always as this is effectively a CSF leak into the cella. And here, one can appreciate that entire gland is pushed up and posterior. So there's not a splitting of anterior and posterior lobes, but the entire anterior and posterior lobe is being pushed superiorly and posteriorly. 
Here's an example of managing a, a, of an arachnoid cyst. Uh, the dura is exposed, and then we very carefully incise the dura overlying the pituitary gland. In this case, the pituitary gland is very thinned out as opposed to a Rathke's cleft cyst where there's usually a healthy thickness of gland in the area here. Um, we want to make sure we preserve the gland um, as it is in continuity with the full gland, and we want to make sure we do not damage the gland early on. Hence, we are very careful with our dural exposure here. Once the dura is exposed, we then elevate this with a 90-degree nerf hook, and here we identify the, the gland itself here. The gland itself can, in some cases, already be absent, but most of the time you can find a thin layer if you're very careful in your dissection here. After we uh, expose this, we then want to puncture the gland. Um, and then really, that's really the extent of the operation. We will explore the cyst contents and you will sometimes identify the source of the, the incompetent diaphragm, which results in the CSF leak. Um, and this is typically treated as one with, with any CSF leak, which is to pack this off with, uh, with fat. So here you can appreciate that the fluid effectively looks like CSF and comes out uh, very uh, liquid in nature, does not have that viscosity that one appreciates with Rathke's cleft cyst. And in this case here, you see a very nice decompression. You can insert in the, the endoscope um, into the cyst and even look around if necessary. But that basically takes care of the cyst. And then uh, effectively the next step is to reconstruct this Initially, we can put some collagen as we do our reconstruction. The collagen is very helpful um, to help prevent a hematoma and to get a hemostasis. And then this is packed off with fat and closed like we did in the prior uh, operation. So how do patients do? This is a case series that was published from uh, USC over 20 years ago. And um, this notes that overall, we are doing quite well with Rathke's cleft cyst. In this series of symptomatic patients, about 18% of patients had a recurrence on imaging, and only about 10% of patients actually needed to have another surgery for their recurrence. The two big factors that increased the risk of recurrence were the presence of squamous metaplasia on pathological evaluation of the cyst wall and fat graft placement, which is often seen with larger cysts um, that require reconstruction or in the setting of a CSF leak. In this series that was published uh, from the Mayo Institute, uh, the symptomatic Rathke's cleft cyst did demonstrate uh, a good, good uh, response with surgery. Here's the overall um, gross total resection rate versus decompression alone. And one can appreciate that the gross total resection rate of Rathke's cleft cyst had a higher chance of progression-free survival of up to 90% uh, out to five years. And this is consistent with the radiographic and symptomatic recurrence, with again, symptomatic reoperation at about 9% for gross total resection versus 17% for decompression alone. Their overall complication rates were nominal, uh, but there was an increased uh, risk of diabetes insipidus and a gross total resection rate, uh, as well as CSF leak in that situation. Only one patient had worsened vision and one patient developed hemorrhage. This was a more recent series from 2011 where Potts et al. demonstrated a grading system of Rathke's cleft cyst, type one being a fully intracellar cyst, as one can see on the imaging here, type two being a cellar supercellar cyst, as is most likely the most common type of cyst, and type three being the <clears throat> superglandular cyst as we had demonstrated before. And this was their breakdown of their, their case series here. They noted that in the setting of a type one cyst, so fully cellar cyst, the uh, recurrence rate was effectively zero out to uh, four years. Whereas superglandular and uh, supercellar extension did have a higher uh, risk of progression-free survival um, that uh, was quite significant with 55% um, at, uh, for type 2 and 38% and for type 3. Interestingly, postoperative DI was significantly higher for these cysts as well uh, due to their extension of the cyst as well as due to the manipulation required for resection. They noted that 
for both univariate and multivariate analyses, the cis type itself was the number one predictive factor to predict recurrence. And so when you have supercellular extension or a superglandular cyst, that is significantly higher risk of recurrence. And interestingly, in this series, squamous metaplasia did not have an increased risk of uh, cyst recurrence. Now, what, what does one do in the setting of an incidental Rathke's cleft cyst? So here's a patient who has growth hormone deficiency, short stature, and will be receiving growth hormone replacement and appropriately has undergone an MRI for evaluation for any potential etiology of the hyposomatism. And a small Rathke's cleft cyst was identified. This is about an eight millimeter Rathke's cleft cyst. One can appreciate it's in between the anterior and posterior lobes, very classic location. But what does one do about these? Well, we tend to observe these and the vast majority of these patients, the cyst does not grow, even in the setting of growth hormone replacement. So this was a two year interval scan and there really was no significant evidence of, of growth. So what does one do with these asymptomatic patients? So here's a patient with a significantly sized cyst uh, with uh, optic chiasm compression. Here's a relatively large, fully intracellular cyst. Here's a relatively sizable supraglandular cyst. And here's a smaller supraglandular cyst. So you know, how does one approach these? Well, this is what we, we aim to answer in our series that we published recently um, with Dr. Sherry Palajwala and, and others contributing to our, our analysis. So in our patients, we had 90 consecutive patients over a six year interval and we had both observational and surgical cohorts in this study. We either had pathological confirmation that these patients had Rathke's cleft cysts or MRI suspicion of the cyst based on the criteria that I had mentioned um, in the prior slides that we demonstrated here. The surgical decision was basically decided by the operative surgeon and after consultation with the patient, of course. So in the series, 54 patients were observed and only 36 patients, 40% actually underwent surgery. The average age was quite similar, about 38 uh, years of age. And interestingly, women tended to require surgery more often than men um, in the surgical cohort. Um, for the observational cohort, the typical presentation was incidentally, as was shown previously, with only 26% of patients having headaches and no other endocrinopathy or vision dysfunction. Whereas in the surgical cohort, only 17% were an incidental finding, 89% of patients had headaches, 35 with endocrinopathy and 19% with visual dysfunction. These were larger uh, findings, both based on volume and maximal, maximal cyst dimension or diameter. So this is looking at patients in either the observation cohort or the surgical cohort. The yellow, sorry, excuse me, the orange suggests that the patient had any symptom, whether it's headaches, vision loss, or endocrinopathy. And the volume is calculated here um, based in uh, cubic centimeters. And one can appreciate overall that the observation cohort was indeed smaller than the surgical cohort, but one can appreciate relatively small cysts that did require surgery in the surgical cohort uh, relative to the observational cohort. In patients with vision loss, um, again, these are patients in orange here with visual deficits. They were all only in the surgical cohort and they are typically larger cystic lesions, as you can see here. Um, patients with hypopituitarism also had relatively larger lesions, uh, as one can appreciate, although there was one or two that had smaller, typically superglandular uh, findings. And uh, again, the patients with headaches, um, there, there were quite a number of patients with headaches with incidental findings that we observed, although um, there, there were again patients that had either growing uh, cysts or required surgery due to their uh, headache presentations. Well, what was the overall outcome? So um, looking at these patients in the observational cohort, 87% remained stable at two years. Only 3% had an increase in the size of their cyst, uh, often requiring surgery. And interestingly, 10% had a decrease in the size of the cyst, uh, likely due to variation in the MRI acquisition. In the observation cohort, 88% uh, uh, 
uh, had a headache, uh, excuse me, in the surgical cohort, 88% of patients had headache resolution. So that's quite a nice finding here relative to other pituitary pathology, which typically have slightly lower headache resolution rates. Endocrinopathy improved 83% and vision improvement was 100%. Uh, imaging recurrence um, on MRI was 25% uh, in the surgical cohort. Um, only 8% were surgical and required, uh, were symptomatic and required for the surgery. When we looked at uh, longer uh, outcomes, we did note that there was about a 22% radiographic recurrence, and in this case, um, 9% of patients that required the reoperation. The average time to recurrence was interestingly quite short at about eight months. Any uh, complications were, were quite low. Hormonal recovery was about 75%. We did not have any new uh, deficits with hormonal dysfunction, including no diabetes insipidus. Visual recovery was 100% with no new vision loss. Headache improvement was significant. There was no postoperative CSF leak, and there were no vascular injuries. So in summary, Rathke's cleft cysts are common pituitary findings. Many can be observed, and the growth rate is quite, quite little. Symptoms can include headaches, vision loss, hyperpituitarism, and or apoplexy. And surgery is very effective with only a 10% chance of, approximately 10% chance of symptomatic recurrence, depending on what study you're looking at. Supercellular extension, squamous metaplasia are often associated with, with recurrence. Thank you very much.